pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A month before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States government began a secret language school at Chrissy Field on the Presidio of San Francisco. It was called the Military Intelligence Service Language School. They began teaching the Japanese language to a carefully selected group of U.S. soldiers, 58 Japanese Americans and two Caucasians. During the course of the war years, over 6,000 men and women graduates made up the MIS, the Military Intelligence Service and were engaged in active duty throughout the European and Pacific War Zones. Their services proved invaluable, acting as interpreters, interrogators, and decoding intercepted Japanese battle orders. At this same time, many Japanese American men were already serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. However, shortly after Pearl Harbor was bombed, the government put a stop to any new Japanese American enlistments. Immediately after Pearl Harbor, my classmates and I, three Caucasian friends, went down to Long Beach Naval uh, Base and we tried to enlist. My friends, my classmates, Ed Hardage, uh, Roy Kettner, Jimmy Keyes, they were taken in immediately. And they came to me, they said, we, we can't take you. And I was upset, I said, why not? I'm an American too. They said, well, you're not 1A, you're 4C designated, which means enemy alien. So immediately, I was no longer a United States citizen. I was an enemy alien. So I was unable to join any branch of the military service of the United States. But as the war went on, and you know, U.S. American troops are getting killed uh, in this big world war of ours, um, everybody recognized that we need as many soldiers as possible. So somebody uh, came up with the idea, why don't we form a segregated unit of Japanese American soldiers? So um, the first thing they did was they went to uh, Hawaii, which was just a territory then. Japanese Americans were not evacuated from Hawaii like the mainlanders uh, into the internment camps. They needed that Japanese American workforce essentially for the sugar uh, cane fields or working in hospitals, the military bases, etc. So they were not evacuated. So because of that high concentration of Japanese Americans in Hawaii, the U.S. Army went to Hawaii and asked for volunteers to form a single battalion. Uh, so they, they asked for uh, 1,000 men to volunteer, and they actually got uh, uh, like four or 5,000 that volunteered. The 100th Battalion was formed by Hawaiian National Guard recruits in Hawaii and sent them eventually from Hawaii to Camp Snelling, Minnesota. And uh, from there, they formed what was called the 100th Battalion, just one battalion of the DC soldiers. And they were shipped overseas in September of 1943, way before the 442nd. So they were in North Africa, attached to the 34th Division, and went into combat in southern Italy, Sicily, invasion of Italy, going up the boot. And they were quite courageous in battle and had so many casualties that they were called the Purple Heart Battalion. The bravery, courage, and valor of the 100th Battalion Japanese Hawaiians were a fitting testimony to the loyalty and commitment of these men serving in combat in the United States Army. Their outstanding heroism and loyalty was the exact opposite of what General John DeWitt, Colonel Carl Bendenson, and other military officials had predicted. As the war went on, the United States government was faced with the growing need to replace the troops that had been wounded or killed in battle. And so, aware of the outstanding valor of the men of the 100th Battalion, the government reversed their classification for Japanese American men from 4C, enemy alien, to 1A, which meant these men were now eligible for enlistment. So what the Army sent 
teams of army recruiters to the 10 concentration camps and to various large cities where the Nisei boys were living, tried to convince them that they should volunteer for the military. Well, there was an immediate question of, what about our civil rights? Give us our liberty. Give us our freedom. Let us out of prison. Then we will volunteer. And of course, the government wasn't going to do that. We're going to keep you locked up. So the sentiment was, well, I don't know if we should do this. Uh, and, uh, quite a huge segment of the population in the camps said, no, we will not do it. But then, looking at it, a number of the boys thought, what if we don't? What's going to happen? Will we ever get out of jail? The big rumor going around the camps were that the Japanese people were going to be sent to Japan in exchange for American war prisoners that Japan was holding. Well, possibly so. So there were enough young Nisei boys that said, we don't care, we have to volunteer, we have to go serve our country. If we don't, we have no idea what can happen to our families. So that way, approximately 4,000 young Nisei boys did volunteer, and that's how the 442nd was formed. The 442nd was a very unique group of people, and of course it was the first that the military had, so they really didn't know what to do. In fact, the first shoulder patch that they issued was a yellow dagger, armed with a yellow, with a red blood hanging on it. I mean, can you imagine that? So the 442nd officer said, we can't have that. So there was a boy in the F Company, a, little, a boy from Watsonville, in fact. He designed the current six-sided patch with the uh, the hand holding the statue of the Torch of Liberty, and that's our passion it always since then. It always has been. Well, the boys from Hawaii were a carefree, happy-go-lucky bunch of boys. They loved to gamble. And of course, when they would gamble, payday would come, and they would spread out their blanket and start rolling their dice and shoot craps, play poker. And it was like, we have to take everybody's money. And it was go for broke. Win or take all. And you didn't just say, well, that's enough, I quit. It was, you quit when you either won it all or you lost it all. So go for broke, and that was it. That was it, and became the model, and became the war battle cry and, and battle also. The newly formed 442nd Infantry was made up of Japanese-American men who had volunteered from the 10 internment camps, from the inland states, and from Hawaii. They were sent to Fort Shelby for combat training and then joined the Japanese Hawaiian 100th Battalion in Italy. By that time, fierce combat had already taken the lives of over half the men of the 100th. The three combined battalions of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team are recognized to this day as the most decorated regiment for its size in the history of the United States military. The 442nd made up of brothers, actual brothers, cousins, uncles, very closely related. There were many who grew up all 18, 19, 20 years of their lives, grew up together, going to the same schools, playing together. So a very close-knit unit. I think that was the main reason why there was so much valor on the battlefield. You see your buddies get shot up and you're out there to protect them. I saw medics go out there and when the, the fire, firefight is just completely so solid that you can't make a move and they just run out there to take care of the wounded. The 442 went on and they fought in uh, Italy and France and, and their record was just very significant as far as their valor and uh, gallantry in action. One of the significant battles was called the Battle of the Lost Battalion. And in this battle, um, there was a battalion of the 36th Division of the Texas National Guard unit that had uh, advanced too quickly and they were in encircled by the Germans. So they were starting to run low on ammunition, supplies. Two units of uh, 
the Texas division tried to rescue them and they were repulsed by the Germans. So the commander uh, asked the people to send in somebody because it was a desperate situation. So the 442nd was picked to rescue these guys. And after four or five days of uh, battle, the 442nd re uh, rescued them and uh, they saved 211 Texans. Uh, but the cost of that uh, rescue was uh, over 800 casualties for the uh, 442nd. During the battle to rescue the Lost Battalion in October 1944, we were in very heavy winter weather. It was raining, cold, it even snowed. And then when the cold weather hit, the fog came in. And it, we're in the trees, in the mud, trying to fight the enemy. And now we can't see. We can only see 15 or 20 feet because of the fog. So my orders to the squad members were, be very careful, stay closer together. You can't spread out. You can't go too far ahead. Look up. If you see an object, watch to see what kind of a helmet he's wearing. If it's straight across, it's an American helmet. If it dips down over the ear, it's a German helmet. So we, it's all we could do. We could hear them talking. They could hear us talking because you couldn't use hang, hand signals anymore. You, you had to holler to each other. It was, oh, it was treacherous. And, you know, you had to get very close because you couldn't see anymore. This is a tough time. This is late October 1944. The 442nd, I mean, the Japanese Americans were so proud of these guys. Uh, and even President Truman was aware of the, um, their record. And when they returned from Europe, President Truman asked them to march down Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C and he, he pinned uh, the presidential unit citation on their flag, and he made some profound words for the troops. He said, uh, uh, you fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice, and you won. The Japanese-American man who served with the 100th Battalion, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and the Military Intelligence Service were not alone. Japanese-American women who wanted to serve their country volunteered for the Women's Army Corps and the Cadet Nurse Corps. Their work in the medical fields, their service as translators, researchers, instructors, clerks, and typists was as dedicated as the men in the MIS and the three battalions of the 442nd. Together, the faithful and loyal services of the Japanese American men and women played a central role in keeping our country safe, liberating our allies, and most importantly, bringing an end to the death and destruction of World War II.